in the talking about sampling and confidence interval. Uh, as I explained in the beginning of the semester, we do statistics to save money uh, because statistics allows you to draw conclusions just from having a few samples as, as, as opposed to uh, <coughs> all the data. And uh, not only it's a money problem, uh, in many cases, uh, just finding all the data could be impossible. Maybe uh, you're trying to say, for example, uh, if you want to know the distribution of the adult height in the United States, males above age 20. Now, how are you going to make it possible? Are you going to send everybody in to measure? It's just, it's impossible. Like, uh, uh, and you know, while you're doing the measurement, if it's so important that you actually had to do it, while you're doing the measurement, some people will turn 20. And so it's like, yeah, it's a kind of iffy, right? So, uh, a lot of times in science and engineering, you have to work with the sample. But if you have a sample, then you have to think about uh, what, what it means, whether the sample represents the entire data well, or maybe uh, you have a sample that's a bit more biased. So those are another kind of considerations. And um, some other questions are like, what kind of answers or uh, what kind of uh, data can you collect from sample that does tell you something about the entire population? OK, so first of all, you need to know this concept of census versus sample. Census is when you have the, the data from all population. So data obtained from the entire population. Whereas sample is data obtained from only part of population. So the other parts are the same, but the data is only obtained from part of this population, some portion of the population. And, uh, you know, if you want to find the uh, average height of all maritime male students, you don't want to go to the basketball team and measure that sample and think that's a good sample for the entire college. That's probably not going to work, right? So whenever you're doing this sample, you need to uh, have some criteria for a good sample uh, or a strategy for good sampling. So there are several sampling methods. So let's see, sampling methods. Okay, and then uh, so, so first one is something called the stratified. This will be true if you know that the entire population can be uh, divided into. Uh, ethnicity or um, maybe whether they're in the sports team or not, stuff like that. Okay? Uh, so let's say if 20% of the maritime males are in some sports team, you want to make, your, make sure that your sample contains about 8 to 2 ratio of people who don't play sports and play sports. Okay? And also with different ethnicity, you might also want to make sure that's represents in proportion. That's stratified. Another one is where uh, it's called systematic. And this will be like, uh, usually when you're in a factory, this, this happens a lot. When you're in a factory and you want to 
test, for example, let's say you're a battery making company and you have like uh, AA size batteries there in your manufacturing and you want to make sure the quality is okay and you, you take some random samples, measure their battery uh, capacity in milliampere hours or something and um, when you do that, uh, you want to spread out your sample in a, a constant interval. Uh, so let's say every 1,000th battery is taken out and you're taking, measuring its uh, ampere of what, hours of what wattage, okay, stuff like that. Okay. So that will be like systematic. Okay. If you have some kind of a criteria where you do some kind of periodic thing uh, so that the, the sampling is done over the entire time of day or uh, day of the week or some period in the uh, month or the season that's uh, systematic. Number three, uh, another possibility is cluster. And this is something that you have to be very careful. Uh, if you're doing cluster set uh, sampling, it's like uh, you choose an area. So for example, uh, you just go to the dorm A and make sure every male students there are their heights are measured. So uh, they'll be like doing cluster. Now in our case it's, it's a little iffy uh, because you might not be including any civilian students but then when you do th something like this you have to make sure that the cluster that you're selecting doesn't really have any, it's like, like there's a, there has to be a reasonable assumption that what you're measuring is independent of the cluster that you're, you're finding. So like, uh, if you think this, the, whether you're a civilian male student or a regiment male student, if their heights are not going to be much different, I don't see a reason why they should be different, right? In that case, that kind of cluster would be okay. Now, uh, the important, important thing about the cl cluster sampling is that when you select an area, you have to make sure that you count, you, you account for everybody in that area. So that that's another way to ensure that uh, it's a good representation of the entire population. So uh, another type of such a cluster sampling would be like uh, selecting a few restaurants and uh, do a survey in that for everybody in this, that, that are dining in that place. That would be a cluster. Uh, but I, I would say this has a slight more danger than, say, stratified or systematic uh, of being biased. So that's, I mean, for example, if you choose a restaurant that's a bit more pricey than other ones, you might have a sample that might affect something that you're trying to measure. So you, you always have to be careful about what what you're measuring in the cluster sampling. Okay, number four, uh, convenience sampling. Convenience sampling it would be like, uh, you don't really care about bias, you just want some sample. So this would be the least reliable kind of sampling. So for example, uh, if you run a, a news website, then you just want to see how popular is President Biden. So you, you have an online survey uh, asking, is President Biden doing a good job? Uh, and then it may depend on the tone of the newspaper, right? Maybe this newspaper is left-leaning and more people are going to say yes, or maybe it's a far-right magazine or website and, and everybody will say terrible, terrible, right? So uh, like if you rely on an easy way to get get samples, uh, a lot of times it's, it's in the form of a survey that uh, you just go outside and ask people around or uh, put something on poll on the, the websites. Those are convenience samples. This will be very unre unreliable. Okay? So you, any, any kind of sample that's obtained this way, you, you may have to think a bit more uh, to trust the, the result. Okay, and then number five, uh, actually this is the most gold standard, which is called the simple random sampling.
And this is the kind where you're assuming that uh, the sampling is done completely randomly. So one way to do it for measuring the height of male maritime students would be like you assign a number to everybody, all the male students in maritime, and you use either a random number generator in your computer or maybe you can do something like a, uh, put all those numbers and put it in the head and you know, just shake it and then draw 10 out of it or something like that. You do that and then make sure those people are accounted for. That would be simple random sampling. Now, this has the least possibility of bias and uh, all the mathematical theorems are developed assuming that we have SRS. Okay, this is also loaded as SRS. So we just assume that your, your sample is SRS. Uh, yeah, so assuming that you have a simple random sample, there's, there are many things that you can do. And uh, here are the questions you can ask. Number one, what is the population mean? Okay. Population average. Number two, what is the population median? And number three, what is the population variance? And as you know, if you take the square root of the variance, you get the standard deviation. So uh, answering that would also give you st uh, standard deviation. Those are the questions that you might want to ask from the sample. And uh, <coughs> you would You would try to figure out uh, yeah so you would try to figure out these these questions and uh, whenever you get these questions uh, you can't really say for sure so let's say we got 20 male adult maritime students above the age, age 20 or older. And we got the average height as something like 5 foot 9. Okay. Do we say that that's also the population mean? No, if you actually got the population mean, it won't be exactly 5 foot 9, but it could be like slightly more or slightly less. Something like that, right? So. Uh, all these questions, when they are answered, they will be answered in the form of a confidence interval. So rather than saying, yes, it's this number uh, x bar, x bar is used for the sample mean, so you get some sample from sampling methods, you get some sample mean, and you would say that uh, it's probably close to this one, but how close? You would say that there's a minus some number to plus some number. And you're going to say that the actual number, uh, mu is the letter we use the, for the population mean. We're going to say that the population mean will be between some number. And this question mark is also known as the margin of error because that's like the maximum difference between your sample mean and the actual mean. So this question mark, uh, let, let's use E. So it's going to be E, where E is the margin of error. And uh, another problem is, uh, this is not even certain. There's always, even in this case where you have simple random sample, just by pure luck, you might have a bunch of people from the basketball team 
and you might end up with a very large estimate. It's because this is all, being, being in the sample is all probability, right? So there are definitely unlucky cases where you get a, a sample, even if you tried your best, you might still end up with a sample that doesn't really uh, ha reflect the entire group. So what happens is that this, this thing called the confidence interval is going to be uh, narrowed, if you want narrower, you would have less confidence level or probability. So uh, usually the way we're going to answer this is like there, there's some confidence level. You might say something like with 95% confidence level, with 95% confidence level, we know that the population mean should be between these two numbers. Okay? And what happens is that if you reduce your confidence level, you can narrow down. Okay? But if you want to be more confident, then you have to make the confidence interval wider. You see, you see why? Does that make sense? If you want to have a smaller confidence interval, that, then the chance of the actual mu fitting into that interval becomes smaller and smaller. Right? So your confidence level will go down if you have narrow ones. But if you widen your confidence interval, then the chance of the actual population mean fitting into that confidence interval will go up as well, right? So you will have higher confidence level, okay? So, so you have some, some kind of a confidence level, CL, confidence level uh, associated with the confidence interval. So this, this one here is called the, this one is called the uh, confidence interval, CI. Okay. So that's something that you can do for the population mean. Uh, on the other hand, uh, for the median, you don't have a reliable way to predict the, the confidence center. I mean, uh, of course, if your sample size is really big, then probably your median obtained from the sample would be close enough for the population median, but there is no uh, <coughs> definite mathematical formula you can use. So this is, uh, so uh, the trouble is, of course, you can talk about, it's probably this, this would be the median, that's what the people publish, but there's no confidence interval because you can't talk about <coughs> confidence level. There's no probability distribution you can use for that, so uh, this becomes hard. So you call, uh, you say that a median is a biased estimator. On the other hand, mean value is an unbiased estimator. There's a sound mathematical theory, assuming that you have an SRS. There's a sound mathematical theory where you can talk, there, there are actually formulas to figure out the margin of error and uh, with the given confidence level. So, uh, and that, that will be like a one, one part that will be, I don't think, maybe I'll have time to do it today, I'm not so sure. Uh, maybe I don't know. So, but, but anyways, uh, that's something that we can definitely do. Here, we, we don't have such a thing. All right, and then what about the variance? Uh, variance is uh, variance is a bit more tricky. It's not true or false. The short answer is yes. You can get the variance. You, you can estimate the variance of the population from. from the sample variance, except that you have to modify something. So let me try to explain why I say that. Okay. Uh, so let's look at the formula for the variance. 
various variance of uh, some sample, let's say you have some samples x, and the way you get where you get the variance is by <coughs> first calculating the distance between the average, sample average, and each individual values. You take square so that everything is positive. And then you divide this by n, 1 over n, where n is the sample size. So that's how you take the variance, right? Uh, well, this is fine if there is no distinction between sample and population, but if this is from, these xi's are samples from population, then this formula is somewhat wrong because uh, you should really be doing, so this, uh, but this is an approximation to, xi minus mu squared, right? Because if you're from the population and you want to know how far each element is away from your, uh, your average, you're really talking about how far you're from the population average, not your sample average. But then, uh, you still feel kind of justified that this is what you should be doing because first of all, you only have a sample. There's no access to the, to the actual population mean. So you're stuck with this, right? Isn't that right? Yeah. And second of all, uh, we know that mu and x bar are not much different. It has this margin of error. I didn't give you the formula yet, but there's some way to estimate the, the maximum difference of these two quantities uh, for a given confidence interval, a uh, confidence level. So these shouldn't be that far off. Okay, so that's why you would think, but it turns out that uh, if you actually put this into practice, then on the average, this value would be smaller than this value. Okay, so I, I could also uh, try to give you some proofs. I realize that it's just too, too time consuming. It's not really uh, giving you, it's not really <coughs> worth it. So. Uh, we're just going to do some experiments with computers to actually just perform some simple random sample and uh, compare this value with uh, some other value. But uh, it will turn out that if you actually have the population variance and you compare with the variance you get from the sample just by doing this, you will always, on the average, it's, it's still mostly un, uh, underestimated. So you somehow have to tweak this to make it slightly higher. And uh, uh, there was this mathematician named Bessel who invented Bessel's correction. And this, this actually can be proved mathematically, OK? Uh, he said that uh, if you instead, uh, it, it's called Sx, or people just write Sx. Instead of dividing by n, if you divide it by 1 over n minus 1 of summation xi minus x bar squared, then this gives you a better approximation to this one. In other words, uh, uh, if you repeated the process of sampling same amount of n size n many, many times, and you looked at this, these quantities and these quantities, and you took the average of these quantities and you took the average of these quantities and measured, uh, compared it with the population variance, you will see that this <coughs> one is closer to the population variance compared to this one. So this dividing by n minus 1 instead of uh, dividing by n, so having 1 over n minus 1 is minus 1, that's called Bessel's correction. Okay? So, Often you you you'll be seeing just just s or sometimes you put s sub x, okay. When you see those symbols, 
So uh, if you have if you have the entire population, then the variance is summation of all the values minus uh, the mu squared, and you divide by the capital N would be the entire population size. If you did this for every element in the population, <coughs> this will be the pop variance of the entire population. And uh, uh, this, this, this value, this quantity actually is called, uh, oh, sorry, there should be a square here. This is called sigma squared, uh, another Greek letter for S. This is a Greek letter for M, for mean. This is a Greek letter for S, uh, for standard deviation. And this is a variance, so it's the square of the standard deviation. So this is the population standard deviation squared. And this is the sample standard deviation squared. And you just have to know that n minus 1 is what you're using. OK? All right, so uh, doing that, and the answer is you could have some uh, approximation for this one, uh, but then because variance is never negative, if you draw the graph of a uh, uh, variance uh, distribution, it, it, go, it looks something like this, and that has a name that's called the chi-square distribution, a and therefore, uh, again, the average will give you a good approximation, but the confidence interval won't be uh, it won't be symmetric. So this, the, the mean one, if you write down the confidence interval, it's symmetric, right? If the mean is uh, at the center uh, of these two quantities, but here, oh, so, so uh, what, what I want to say that uh, this interval has a shape where x bar is, is the middle and x bar plus e would be here x bar minus e would be here because uh, it has the same distance e, right? Uh, so this interval is symmetric with respect to the, your sample estimation. But that's not no longer true for the variance. Uh, but this is, this is later subject, so uh, we, we will not be discussing it. But what we do need to know is that uh, we will frequently use the variance by the Bessel's correction, okay? Estimated by the Bessel's correction. Okay, so let me...